Hello and welcome to Outlook Weekend. This is Matthew Bannister with some of the best true life stories from this week's programmes. As a teenager, Winnie Biyanyima fled to the UK, escaping from the repressive regime of Idi Amin in her native Uganda. She arrived with $300 in cash, which turned out to be fake. But Winnie didn't let that stop her. She graduated in aeronautical engineering, went back to Uganda to join the resistance and ended up as an MP. After working with the African Union and the United Nations, she's now become the first African director of the charity Oxfam International. On the line from Oxford in the UK, where she's now based, Winnie told me more about her extraordinary life, starting off with growing up in southwest Uganda. My parents were school teachers, but later on moved on to do other things. My father became the local member of parliament, and my mother was an activist in the community and a women's rights leader. So was there an atmosphere in the house of trying to help other people in society? Absolutely. When I was growing up in the 60s, there was a a growing dictatorship. The government that had taken power at independence became dictatorial. I am speaking as the President of the Republic of Uganda and the Commander-in-Chief of Uganda Armed Forces. Uganda Armed Forces must not surrender their arm to any rebellion complete. We are in full control. My father was on the opposition, so many, many people whose rights were, were violated came to our home because most of the opposition leaders were coerced to vote to the government side. They crossed, but my father didn't. So we were a center for really resisting oppression from the government and women, men, civil servants, people who were oppressed all came home. And that's the environment in which I grew up, resisting uh, violation of human rights and dictatorship. I wonder what effect that had on you as a child. Oh, a lot, a lot. First of all, I really learned to stand up for myself. My parents always taught us that you have to stand up for what is right. You don't have to get killed, but you have to say no and not compromise your values. What sort of things did you do? Did you take action yourself? Not when I was a child, but certainly, yes, in school debates, in class, I often was a a different voice. Other children were learning, perhaps from their families, that you had to make concessions and agree with a corrupt, a dictatorial, a brutal regime that you didn't challenge. I learned that you had to speak the truth and you had to say it in the most respectful way, but you had to stand up and say the truth. So I often got into really heated debates with teachers, with students, uh, and that's how I grew up. And I suppose you also must have had a growing awareness of the danger of standing up for your principles in that way. What was it that led to you at the age of 17 having to come to the United Kingdom? Uh, well, I was at the university, had qualified, and I was a, you know, an engineering student at Macquarie University. But Were people being rounded up, people who yes. opposed the government? Many people were being rounded up, students were being killed or disappearing, our teachers, our university professors were vanishing, and in that context, I too became unsafe, and at some point, sat with my parents, and the decision was that you need to get out of here very fast. So my mother helped me across the border, and I followed so many people who were also escaping. Was it difficult to get across the border? It was risky. It was risky. First of all, you couldn't get a passport to travel to the West because most countries in Europe and America had uh, severed relations with Idi Amin. So to get a passport, Idi Amin had made it so difficult. So my mother went and got me a passport from uh, a little illegal shop that processed illegal travel documents. That's what I came with. And I declared it as soon as I arrived in England. And you also came with a very small amount of money that your mother had given you, didn't you? Yes, we crossed the border at night, uh, really risked getting shot by Idi Amin soldiers if we were caught taking an illegal route. We got into Nairobi, and there, exiles who had already set up uh, their homes there helped my mother and I to get me a visa to the UK, and she, she then again went on the black market and bought... There was no bank that offered foreign currency. And 
put it in my hands as I was leaving and uh, I landed with $300 in London at Heathrow. What happened when you tried to change that into pounds sterling? <laughs> that was terrible. I was at the airport and I went straight to a, 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 a bureau and uh, handed in $100. Then the, the lady at the counter looked around, checked behind and then co- made some calls and suddenly a big tall policeman arrived and took the money and said to me that I had a uh, fake currency. I started to cry. I explained that in Uganda you cannot get money from a bank. We had bought it on the underground in the black market and couldn't have known whether it was fake or not. And he saw me crying and saw this pathetic girl and tore it up and said, look, this is a crime. You could have gone to jail for seven years, but I'm forgiving you because I can see you, you, you're you coming from a difficult situation. Never do this again. But for one policeman to really look at a situation and make a good judgment and see that I was not smuggling currency, I was just a victim, I, I thought that was a great thing. So you didn't have any money. How did you manage to establish your life in the UK? There was already a large community of Ugandans who were esca- mostly intellectuals who were escaping the brutal regime of Amin. They had services, they helped each other and when I arrived they showed me where I could apply for a scholarship. I applied. I got one from a refugee agency, the World University Service. I'll always be proud of, of and happy and uh, grateful for what they did for me. And they paid for me to go to Manchester University and really that changed my life. And that's when you, st- you studied off. aeronautical engineering there? I did. Uh, and out of curiosity, really. I was a good student when I, w- I was growing up, and uh, I just thought that must be the greatest thing to do. Uh, and what was your ambition at that time? What did you see uh, unfolding as your career? So I knew right there that I'm going to get a degree in aeronautics, but I'm going to find my way back to what I want to do, which was really to continue fighting for social justice. So you went back to Uganda eventually. What was the political situation that you found when you arrived back in your home country? After my degree, Idi Amin had collapsed. By that time, I had really honed political skills. I had been part of the human rights movement abroad, the dissident movement, resisting Amin. I'd learned how to protest, how to do diplomatic uh, resistance, how to organize. I had joined a political party branch abroad. So when I went home, I was already a really seasoned political activist and also a women's rights activist. So I continued to be p- to participate in political groups and uh, also and took a job. Yeah, what job did you take? I took a job with the airline company, Uganda Airlines, as a flight engineer. This wasn't really a, a very highly scientific job, but it was just a technical job. And I took it because I had, by this time, agreed to serve in the national resistance movement, which was now waging uh, popular resistance against a new dictatorship. Mm. An armed struggle had begun, led by President Yoweri Museveni, at that time a, a rebel leader. And I had decided I'm going to support this struggle against dictatorship and, and, and against the violation of human rights. So, so how did your job help in that? Very much, because with my job, I, could, I traveled. I was a crew member on the Boeing's, Boeing 707s that we flew. I was a flight engineer. I traveled in and out of Uganda, and I could be a courier for the guerrillas in the bush. And so for a number of years, I supported the armed struggle. What, sort, what sort of things were you bringing in and out of the country? Medicine, supporting uh, uh, our combatants who were injured, finding them homes where to be, passing on information and things like that. It must have been highly dangerous work. Of course it was risky and at some point I was discovered and had to very quickly go on the underground and leave my job and go to join the rebels. So you went to live in the bush, did you? (laughs) I did. What was that like? 
it changed me, transformed me, because for the first time I was living amongst peasant people, rural people. I had grown up in a little town in a middle class family, and I was now face to face with the majority of our people and began to understand how they live their lives, how the system, the elite political system really crushed them and denied them rights daily from birth until they died, and it really radicalized me. And did you find hardship living in the bush too? Did you personally undergo hardship? I had to learn how to survive like everybody else. It was a a situation where everybody shared what was there, and uh, we had the means to organize tents where to live, to organize food to be cooked, and we ate. And But it was very basic. Did you come under attack yourself? I never had to face, uh, to be in a combat situation. All the roles I played were not in combat. They were diplomatic, administrative, political, so I was never on the front line immediate during a, a combat. But sometimes I went there when a battle had just been fought and I could see the the aftermath. I, could, I saw death, I saw combatants injured, I saw, you know, I saw the bad things that you see in war. So then the political situation changed again and, and you were eventually elected as an MP in Uganda and one of the issues that you espoused as an MP was women's rights. Why did you think that was so important to make a change in that area? I was raised by a mother who cared passionately about women's rights. She was, she left her job as a teacher and stayed at home as a a stay-at-home mom to raise us and during that time led women in the community, formed women's clubs and I heard them from my childhood really organizing around the big issues of women at that time like the right to education, keeping girls in school. And I saw them really, I saw my mom fight, real fights over stopping parents from marrying off their 13-year-olds or keeping girls in school. So I grew up passionate about the rights of women. And my mom was a role model. She never accepted barriers of culture and tradition. She went out, she opened a shop, she ran a hardware store. She she did all the things that women were not supposed to do, but she did them to make life better for us. So I was always passionate. So when I was elected to parliament, one of my reasons for wanting to be elected was exactly that, to make a constitution that was going to give girls and women equal rights in a democracy. You went on to work for the African Union Commission and then the United Nations, and it was from there that you were headhunted for the job of International Director of Oxfam. How did you feel when they approached you? When Oxfam approached me, I thought, they have to be joking. This is a British organization. There must be British people who can do this. (laughs) So I asked them, and that's when I realized that Oxfam, this great organization that was born here, in Oxford, where I'm sitting now, is in fact a global organization that the British people gave birth to. So I was excited at the opportunity and went for the interview. And then here I am. I was fortunate. I'm honored. You say uh, truly global. Does that mean a change in emphasis from being an organization based in the UK, delivering aid and what you might call charity to other countries, to one that is based all over the world? Yes, absolutely. You've got countries hit by Ebola like Liberia and Sierra Leone. We still need aid to support countries that are in crisis and that can't balance their budgets yet. But we're also seeing many of the countries becoming richer but still having millions of people living in poverty, that injustice of poverty. So in those countries, we hold hands and help people living in poverty to claim their rights from their governments because the countries are becoming richer. Now, you said that you're speaking to me from Oxford, which is where you now live, but I understand that your husband still lives in Uganda on the farm that you own there. How often do you see him? Oh, we see each other like 
four or five times in a year. He comes to see me about three times. I go home about two times. That's not very often. I know for you English people, European people, you want to be, you have these small nuclear families and you, you are tight, you are together 24 hours, seven days a week. We Africans see families differently. A family is bigger than a man and his wife and children. There are, there's a father, there's a granddad, there's, there are relatives, and we don't always have to be living together. Don't you miss him? I miss him. I miss him very much, and uh, and I, I also miss my son. Well, now your son, we should say, else. yeah, your son is in boarding school in the United States. And my son doesn't find it very strange. In fact, he's so happy to be where he is. He won a scholarship. So we, we Skype, we phone, we we meet now and again. And But it sounds to me as though you've made some sacrifices to your family life in order to prioritize the very important work that you're doing. Is yes. that a fair characterization? It is a privilege to serve. And uh, it comes with a few uh, sacrifices. And of course, one of them is that I can't have my my husband, my son around me all the time. I bet you work very hard, but what do you do when you get a day off? When I get a day off, I love your countryside. I'm a really rural girl from Africa. So I walk just uh, uh, five minutes from my home. There is something called Port Meadow. There is a commons with people's cows. I just walk there and look at the cows and I look at people's gardens and I love your countryside. I walk around the countryside.